In today's video, we're going to be covering cerebral palsy and the general condition, what it can cause and how to treat it. Uh, cerebral palsy is a group of motor disorders or syndromes uh, which is related to an early insult to the brain, so the, causing uh, early brain developmental issues. Uh, so um, what we'll start with is going to be uh, some of the causes, so the etiological factors. Uh, and there are going to be many, so you got to kind of bear with me here. Uh, so the first etiological factors can be caused antenatally, which is the most common, uh, 80, up to 80%. Uh, and, th you know, these are just some type of intrauterine infection uh, that the mother might have. Uh, there's also going to be intrapartum, uh, which does occur. This is usually due to some asphyxia, uh, and that's about 10%. And it's going to be a birth asphyxia that uh, occurs during birth, and that can lead to ischemia and brain insults. And finally, we have postnatal. Uh, and these are going to be, again, another 10%. Uh, and this can be caused due to, say, a, uh, an uh, almost drowning situation. Uh, it can also be due to kernicterus, which is caused by increased bilirubin levels. And finally, it can be caused by uh, infections. So postnatal infections, which are particularly severe, can then uh, lead to uh, cerebral palsy. Uh, so what are some risk factors associated with it? Uh, by far, the most important risk factor is being premature. Uh, premature uh, d generally you know, leads to low birth weight uh, and 20% uh, of these babies uh, do tend to have um, cerebral palsy and the main condition that leads to cerebral palsy is either going to be uh, uh, paraventricular leukomalacia uh, which is a disorder of the illegal dendrocyte in the brain uh, it can also be due to intraventricular hemorrhage uh, which is going to be hemorrhaging into the fourth ventricle of the brain and uh, that can cause uh, damage to the uh, areas surrounding it. And finally, paraventricular hemorrhage, where you have uh, hemorrhage into the area surrounding the ventricles. Uh, so after premature, the next uh, major cause would be intrauterine growth restriction. Uh, also, intrauterine infection, which is a very common cause of intrauterine growth uh, restriction. And these infections can, uh, you know, can be cytomegalovirus, uh, you have syphilis, uh, varicella zoster virus as well is a common cause, uh, toxoplasmosis, uh, you know, when in, when in utero, and finally, um, a, the, one of the more common ones is going to be chorioamnionitis, and this is when the uh, chorion and the amniotic fluid it becomes uh, infected. Uh, after this, we have uh, antepartum hemorrhage. Uh, antepartum, uh, actually, sorry, before we get to antepartum hemorrhage, let's go to hypoxic ischemic injury. Uh, what is is this is basically they get hypoxia during uh, birth and then they get ischemia with brain ischemia which leads to cerebral palsy. Uh, then we have congenital abnormalities, uh, many congenital abnormalities associated with this and this is also related to the fact that uh, there are some genes that make it susceptible and so family history has been shown to be a factor here. Uh, specific congenital abnormalities is going to be brain malformation. Um, this has been, you know, some specific brain malformations do kind of have a high chance of becoming uh, cerebral palsy. Stroke, uh, postnatal strokes, uh, they do occur due to thromboembolism, uh, and so that can be a cause of cerebral palsy as well. And um, intracranial hemorrhage is another one that we can uh, m mention here, uh, and this usually is thalamic. Uh, and um, multiple pregnancies is an interesting one. Um, the reason why this is, is associated with uh, cerebral palsy is because multiple pregnancies is associated with other risk factors such as uh, low birth weight. Let me get this right. Okay, low birth weight, uh, congenital. Uh, they they have more common congenital conditions. Uh, it's more common for them to have cord entanglement. And interestingly, uh, if you have a death of a co-twin, so if one of the t twins dies, uh, then the other twin that's remaining has an increased risk of uh, cerebral palsy. So that's a real interesting one to uh, keep in mind. Now let's move on to some of the uh, clinical findings uh, that you may find. Uh, so, you know, primarily it's going to be a motor symptom, but there are some non-motor symptoms which I'll cover first. Uh, the first thing is going to be they can have mental retardation. Uh, you can also associate with epilepsy, um, even a lot of hearing and visual as well uh, is associated with this. Cognitive, so they usually you know aren't able to do well in school like other students, uh, and um, finally speech and behavior. So th they do have sometimes have a difficulty speaking because of the motor 
deficiencies that they may have. Um, so beyond this, uh, there are three main syndromes that are associated with uh, cerebral palsy, uh, one being more severe than the other. So um, the first one is going to be sp spastic hemiplegia, and this is one side of the body is uh, affected. Then we have uh, spastic diplegia or spastic paraplegia, and in this situation, uh, just the bottom feet are affected. And finally, we have spastic quadriplegia, which is the most serious and the, the whole entire body is affected, all the limbs, even the head, trunk, neck. So uh, if you first look at uh, spastic hemiplegia, uh, first thing you'll notice is the arm, the, the, uh, the wrist is bent and the arm is bent, uh, and they're usually very floppy, not really able to use it. Um, and what we'll notice is um, very early on they have a hand preference. So they tend to use one arm more than the other. And walking is also delayed anywhere from 18 to 24 months. And so th that's another common uh, feature of uh, hemiplegi hemiplegic uh, CP. Uh, they do have their, their foot does have equina vera, so it's going to go inwards. And this is why they tend to walk with their tippy toes. Uh, they do have increased deep tendon reflexes, uh, ankle clonus, which again leads to tippy toe walking. And the Babinski sign is positive, which is what, uh, one of the signs of the upper motor neuron lesion. So moving on to paraplegia, which is uh, affection, you know, of, of the bottom half of the body. And so what is the difference between paraplegia and hemiplegia? Hemiplegia is one side of the body, whereas paraplegia is the bottom half of the body. And you call it diplegic if the abdomen or someplace else is affected. So um, usually uh, what you'll have is um, the, the patient has contractions of the foot. Uh, there's going to be... Uh, they uh, they usually they will also have let me see here yeah so uh, yeah so you can see basically the same thing but at the bottom of the feet so same thing as uh, hemiplegic let's talk about quadriplegic uh, this is the most severe it is associated with swallowing deformities which can lead to aspiration pneumonia uh, you can you can see here that the all the limbs are contracted uh, they usually have severe atrophy of the entire body all all the limbs and the entire body and so they're not able to walk and they're pretty much just bedridden and uh, they need a lot of support. Um, so what would you do as far as uh, the workup goes? Uh, so they're the pretty much, um, you know, lab workup is pretty useless. There is no lab that will help you figure anything out. Uh, so you would want to do an MRI. Uh, MRI does help rule out uh, other pathologies. Uh, and you also want to do hearing and visual uh, function. Um, because that can obviously be affected and if you want to look for some underlying cause you can try to do a genetic or even a metabolic uh, evaluation of the patient um, so yeah that's pretty much investigations nothing much more that you'd want to do treatment uh, it is going to be lifelong treatment uh, they're going to need a lot of occupational physical therapists social workers uh, education educators even developmental psychologists uh, so what you do want to treat though is going to be the spasticity. You want to try to decrease the spasm as much as possible. Uh, there are some medications that can help with that. Uh, the first one is going to be oral dantrolene sodium, which has been shown to decrease some of the spasticity. Uh, you can also use a, uh, a baclofen, uh, which is another one that uh, does help. Uh, and this can actually be done intrathecally for more effect. Uh, botulinum can be used on a specific muscle group. Uh, and this specifically uh, helps with drooling and um, yeah, those are going to be the medic medical ones after this you want to go for some surgical procedures uh, the, the first one is going to be uh, related to the soft tissues so you can do what's called a psoas transfer and release which will kind of help loosen up the uh, hip abductors and so it can help, with, uh, uh, help them with that uh, you can also do what's called an uh, adductor tenotomy which again, again is going to help uh, kind of loosen up the hips so they can move their legs uh, more freely and finally you have a rhizotomy and basically rhizotomy is when you just cut a few of the spinal nerves so uh, and that helps l loosen up some of the spasticity uh, so the other thing is you do want to get a motorized wheelchairs uh, you do want to tr try some type of uh, special you know use special feeding devices to prevent them from aspirating especially if they're quadriplegic uh, there are special typewriters that they can use so they can communicate much more easier because again they don't have control of their mouth as much as uh, they need to to speak freely and finally you want to give them custom seating arrangements because they will be uh, sitting for a long time hope you guys enjoyed that see you in the next video bye